This gun was the original shooter of the 357 SIG. Hello everyone and welcome back to AmmoMart.com. Today I'm going to satisfy a lot of our subscribers' interest in the 357 SIG caliber. Since we began shooting the videos, we've gotten a lot of comments and a lot of requests to spend some more time with this caliber, and I'm really excited to do it today because along the way, I've actually learned a lot about it myself. For those of you that may not be aware, the 357 SIG debuted in 1994 and was actually developed by, of course, SIG Sauer. Their intention was to give a 357 Magnum caliber revolver, but in a semi-automatic pistol. Oddly enough, like most things in the gun world, that really wasn't a new idea. For instance, they accomplished that by taking a 10 millimeter case, shortening it, and turning it into a bottleneck. Now, sounds innovative, but really wasn't. In fact, since the 1960s, manufacturers had started to develop the same kind of ammo using more powerful cartridges. For instance, the 221 Remington Jet cut down a 357 Magnum case and bottlenecked it, put it in a 22 caliber revolver. I've personally seen one of those guns. I sold it when I was in sales, and wow, what a sweet revolver. Remington also made the 221 Fireball by cutting down the Remington 222 rifle cartridge. However, the first modification of the 357 Magnum cartridge came from Winchester when they developed the 257 Winchester Magnum. So you can see the framework was laid approximately 30 years before SIG got onto the idea of the 357 SIG. And perhaps one of their catalysts for doing that was a caliber called the 10 millimeter Dillon, but it actually wasn't 10 millimeter. They had cut a 10 millimeter case to modify it to accommodate a nine millimeter bullet. And it was called the Dillon. That was a very popular caliber amongst IPSC shooters, but really didn't catch on only in that sort of interest group. And it was a fabulous little round, but there it laid. I couldn't say for certain whether or not that's how SIG got the idea to do all of this, but what they came up with was 357 SIG bottleneck. One of the interesting things about this is it has a very, very, very good reputation for stopping power. All coupled with that, it also has a very good reputation for being very recoil sensitive. Later on in some successive videos, we're going to go out and compare it side by side with a 40 caliber, 10 millimeter, and a 357 Magnum cartridge to see, based on my subjective opinion only about its recoil, and see potentially where it stopped, where it, where, where it lines up. More on that in a minute. Specifically, this caliber fits a 357 diameter bullet. It's 29.6 millimeters long. A lot of people are confused about the idea that 40 was developed, or 357 SIG was developed out of the 40 caliber round, and that's not true. Totally not true. 10 millimeter is its parent case. In fact, it's slightly longer than the 40 Smith & Wesson caliber. A lot of people are unaware of that. But because of their similarities, a lot of manufacturers allow you to buy a 357 SIG replacement barrel or a 40 if you have the 357 SIG. Some cautionary tales about that though. If you own a 40 Smith & Wesson caliber handgun, make sure that it will handle the extra pressure that the 357 SIG round provides. This is roughly rated by SAMI at around 40,000 PSI. This one is 45,000. Sometimes it's listed as 44, but still a successive diet of 357 SIG in your 40 may not be the best thing for your gun. So please do your homework before you make the conversion. So brass tacks with the 357 SIG. It's available in a lot of different bullet weights, 100 to 125 grain or so. 125 is pretty much the standard. It runs a muzzle velocity of 1400 feet per second. Depending on the round and the blend and the projectile, that provides somewhere between 500 to 700 foot-pounds of energy on the target. Very, very impressive numbers. But back to that 1400 feet per second, 
One of the inherent positive characteristics of the 357 SIG round is its accuracy. Its accuracy is almost legendary. And the, why, the reason why that is, is because the more speed you have, the more accuracy you're typically going to have. Think about it. It's by percentages way, way, way faster than nine millimeters. So you should get, in theory, more consistency. Now, let's talk about some of the downsides to the round. First thing, cost. It's at least 50% more expensive than 40 Smith & Wesson and infinitely more expensive than nine millimeter under normal conditions. Another downside to the round is that it's reported to have an unbelievably bad recoil. A word on that. I didn't do very well in high school in physics, but we're gonna talk about physics for a couple of seconds, so bear with me. A lot of people try to describe recoil by muzzle velocity versus projectile weight, and you get a recoil number. That's not inherently true though, because a better way to look at it is the mass of all of the things that the barrel is ejecting times the projectile grain, grainage weight. And what I mean by that is when you bottleneck a cartridge, it produces a lot more gas than a straight wall. So in theory, a 357 SIG should recoil slightly less than 40, but the reality is it doesn't because it doesn't take into effect the rocket-like nature of this bottleneck cartridge. Notice shaped like a rocket, some people claim, also recoils like a rocket. I've shot this bullet on the range and I can tell you in my own humble opinion, using a Glock, it did recoil more than a 40. Now, that could be, and I can't recall what ammunition I had been using at the time because it was a few years ago. It's entirely possible that I got a souped up round or a hot round, I can't really recall. But my first instinct, the first time I shot the 357 SIG was, wow, that's a lot of recoil. Back to physics, it's supposed to produce about nine pounds of felt recoil to the shooter and roughly a 32 ounce pistol. Don't know whether that's actually true or not, and nor can I state on whether or not that's comfortable across a wide range of shooters. Right now, until I get out on the range, my feeling is it's probably not. Let's go back to the history. Sig Sauer, of course, developed the round. They originally produced it in this pistol, the Sig 229. Safety check first, make sure we're all clear here. This gun was the original shooter of the 357 Sig. Note, double action only. Quickly after that, it, it came out in the 226 version as well. Glock was right behind with the Model 31, 32, and 33, respectively. The Model 31 was the full size, sort of like their 17, if you want to compare it to the 9mm. Then the 32 was closely sized with the Glock 19, and the Model 33 was also closely linked to the Glock 26 to give you a mental picture. Later on, we're gonna do a video on where 357 SIG stacks up in the everyday carry world. Some say it does, some say it doesn't, but there's actually more options out there for pe than people think once you understand what's going on with the caliber and the manufacturers of the pistols. I personally don't think that 357 SIG has much of a future. What makes me state that is, Sig Sauer no longer produces a pistol that shoots that caliber, Glock does. So that's what we call in the police business a clue. Probably not gonna flourish as a caliber from here on out, but in my opinion, will also retain a huge closet following because of some of its more positive characteristics. I think when we test it into gel, it's going to hold up quite well. But however, if you get involved with this caliber, buyer beware, availability is not there and the cost is going to be extremely high. Hope you've enjoyed this little bit of history on the 357 SIG and wait for our next video on the concealed carry.